Hello, welcome to the third installment of the World Reimagined Masterclass. This masterclass is entitled The Globe as Your Canvas. I am Ashley Shaw Scott Ajay, the Artistic Director of the World Reimagined, a national education project that explores the transatlantic slave trade and how it relates to us today and in our future. We will explore this topic today, the globe as your canvas with two phenomenal artists. But first, I'd like to give you a quote. Truth is not as important as the telling it is given. Truth is not as important as the telling it is given. This was a quote I heard from poet Nana Asase. And in the context of the transatlantic slave trade, I find this quote very provocative. When I think about the imagery of the transatlantic slave trade, there are some really potent graphic images that are used over and over and have come to define this period of history. And in that repetition of this canon of images, there is a telling of a story. And the singularity of that perspective has driven the narrative around the transatlantic slavery and the way that story is told. So my hope is that this project expands this canon and that we find multiplicity within this history and we give that multiplicity a voice. And this, this is where the artists come in. This is where I invite you to participate in the expansion of this canon and of this story. So the World Reimagine uses sculpture trails to explore this story. Um, these uh, sculptures are 1.4 by 1.8 meters, including the plinth. And they're hollow, they're made of fiberglass. And the shape of them was created by none other, by the extraordinary Yinka Shonavari, um, who will come on in just a moment as he is one of our guests today and he is our founding artist. So uh, years ago when Michelle and Dennis brought this project to, um, to my attention, immediately I thought of Yinka um, because of his extraordinary body of work. And so um, as, uh, uh, when Dennis and Michelle met with him, they then um, the Inca, uh, understood the, the power of the project and he suggested the globe. And that is what uh, we now use today as our sculpture. And beyond that, he designed his, his sculpture and named it The World Reimagined, which is now what we have named this entire project. So we are deeply grateful for Yinka's participation and for his support from the beginning of The World Reimagined and the beginning even before The World Reimagined was The World Reimagined. So um, Yinka, uh, to give you a, a brief introduction, is um, uh, an artist who works in painting, sculpture, photography, film, installation. Um, he studies colonialism, post-colonialism, um, globalization, race, class. He has um, really do, uh, explored and, and mined the understanding of cultural identity, the relationship between Africa and Europe. There are so many ways in which um, Yinka really leads the, um, leads the way as we explore these topics in art. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Yinka Shonabari today to our masterclass. Yinka. Okay. Hello. Hello, Hello, Yinka. Well, thank you for, um, for having me. And, um, you know, so I will try and um, go through the idea of the world reimagined. And, um, you know, so I'll, I'll take you through that. 
Um, so maybe at this point, we should have the, uh, the first image up. Perfect. So, um, of course, you know, we all know about the uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade. And this project is around the triangular trade. But what I want you to bear in mind is that um, a lot of things we consider um, conventional or normal are basically fictions, they're narratives. And we also know that history is often written from the point of view of the winners. Um, and so what I want to show you today is that every historical um, act, achievement, all of these things start from somebody's imagination. It starts from other people's narratives. And I also want to demonstrate that you can take control of the narrative. And as an artist, you're able to actually reimagine the world from your perspective. So it doesn't have to be from other people's perspective, you know, you are empowered. And so um, the first image is an image of reimagining the idea of an explorer. Now, historically, when you think of an explorer, you, you're probably thinking of a white guy um, who's really taking over the world and colonizing people, subjugating people. Um, but the idea of the explorer can be different and, and that can change. So that's um, a work I made uh, earlier. Okay, so can we go to the next one? Um, so, we also know that um, the world, the Greeks had a completely different idea of what the world looked like. Um, as far as they were concerned, the world consisted of uh, Europe, Asia, and North Africa. And this is um, you know, Herodotus' uh, idea of the world, um, a Greek uh, historian specializing in uh, Persian, uh, wars uh, with the Greeks. So, so that gives you, you know, but he created a map within the scope of his own imagination at the time and the people around him. And of course, you know, we know that, you know, West Africa, you know, there were worlds beyond this, North America, South America, but they don't ex exist here um, from his perspective or from the Greek perspective. So if we go to the next one. Okay, so um, around the 1300s, um, the Mapamundi was a uh, Christian view of the world. And in this world, also Africa, um, Asia uh, and Europe uh, existed. Jerusalem was, um, right at the center there. And this was a world also, not just the physical uh, cartography of the world. It was also uh, several mythological stories were depicted, biblical stories, um, again, from the medieval perspective. And now if we go to the next image. So people um, imagined uh, other creatures in far flung places. So this is how uh, they imagine somebody in India. Uh, so there's this creature here that uh, the monocule was imagined as uh, somebody who used his foot to protect himself from the sun and that they, they moved really fast. And, you know, so if, when people are ignorant of others, they imagine them as monsters and creatures, and we know the social and economic consequences of uh, imagining other people uh, as uh, less than, and the consequences of which we still suffer today. Okay, so can we go to the next image? 
And so this is the, the father of the um, Atlas, as we know, a Mercator. So he created a, uh, a maritime uh, map uh, based on uh, trade at the time, at the time of the, uh, the Flemish Golden Age. And the countries actually far away from the equator were made uh, a lot bigger. Now, uh, Amer North America and Europe uh, were put at the top. And, um, you know, so now what I'm trying to do here or show you is that some of the uh, structures that, that the mythologies created, either through cartography, through narratives, some of those things are directly responsible for the way that other people are being treated because of the hierarchies created either through mapping or, or other, way, other ways. Uh, so can we go to the next one? And so this is the uh, famous map of the British Empire, the British colonies, all the, uh, you know, Australia, Nigeria, uh, North America, um, belonging to Britain. And so again, this is to, uh, this is a map which, which really um, illustrates uh, the fantasy, if you like, of power or the fantasy of dominance or even the fantasy of discovery. Um, we all know that, you know, um, America existed before America was actually quote unquote discovered. And so can we go to the next one? And so at this point, I want to, uh, and so this brings us to the project itself and also to illustrate how other artists have imagined uh, maps or they've imagined their own worlds. Now, when I say maps, so we use maps now, understand that this is simply a metaphor. A map is a vehicle for expressing, you know, uh, narratives. You know, maps are ways of telling stories. Um, and so, uh, an artist called uh, Alghero Boetti, an Italian artist, he actually looked at the way that the boundaries of uh, nations have shifted over a period of 20 years. And so he commissioned um, Afghan women to uh, embroider uh, those maps. And he did that project over a period of 20 years. He made, I think, about 150 of those maps. Wow. And within, uh, you can see the various countries and the uh, flags within those countries. But if you compare this map to the other maps he made, you will see how those national boundaries have shifted. Now, the whole notion of nat uh, national boundaries, I will come to that um, in a second. But we know that national boundaries, are, you know, they have been uh, artificially uh, constructed. And the whole notion of nationalism is a relatively modern concept. Now, can we go to, to uh, the next one? And this is uh, Susan Hiller. Now, Susan Hiller uh, created this map of dreams. Um, she um, asked a few people to, um, to lie down within uh, those fairy circles and the natural circles formed by uh, the growth of mushrooms. And so then they were asked to record their dreams. And then she made, um, so she developed works uh, from that. Now, if we go to the next one. And so she put those dreams on tracing paper uh, of the different people and she overlapped them and she created this new work. Um, now, I included this work, again, to show you that actually um, many of the things we have come to, to, uh, to take as uh, real or convention are just formulated from other people's imagination. That's all they are. Okay, so can we go to the next one? 
And this is also an interesting uh, take by an artist called Simon Patterson. And that's um, the London Underground. Now he's reimagined the London Underground and he's filled the map with the names of philosophers, artists, writers, and so on. So you can see, you know, Laurence Olivier, um, in, you know, uh, and so on, you know, Rupert Murdoch, and so on. So the different destinations are the names of people uh, like Descartes and, uh, and so on. Okay, so can we go to the next one? Um, now, this is an Aboriginal map. Now, for us Westerners, we may not be able to decipher what's going on here, but you know, these are maps that kind of hold the narratives of the culture, um, you know, places where people could trade, places where uh, people could find water. And, but to us, it just looks like a pattern, but actually uh, these maps hold very important, um, you know, narratives for the community. Uh, they're about memory, imagination, uh, culture, um, mm -hmm. and so on, very rich for those societies. Uh, okay, so can we go to the next one? And that's just another uh, image of, um, you know, of one of those uh, Aboriginal maps. Um, okay, so go to the next one. So here is the center of what we're here to uh, talk about today. We know that about 12.8 uh, million people were enslaved uh, over a period of about 400 years, uh, beginning mostly in the 16th century. And we, we've seen the, the images and we understand the consequences uh, of uh, the enslavement of people. Um, but what I want to do is to, so if we take the uh, triangular trade as the starting point, um, I want us then uh, to, as artists, to say, okay, look, we know the images, we've seen all of those, but we uh, want to demonstrate agency. Uh, this is uh, a map for me, which very much depicts the uh, Africans as being passive uh, with no agency, mm -hmm. uh, being traded as goods. Um, and I think that in our time, we also need to take control of that narrative. Mm -hmm. and we, we need to remake uh, the world from our perspective. And um, so I did uh, uh, my own example. Um, so can we go to the next? Okay, so first of all, I, I want to, uh, before I go on to, to uh, my, my map design, I want to talk about colonization and, um, and also uh, nationalism. And, and particularly in Africa and the way that Africa has been divided up into different countries. And uh, we know in the 19th century, there was a meeting in Berlin, uh, the Berlin Conference about 1894 to 1895. Um, and um, it was, so about 14 European nations sat around the table and they divided up Africa amongst themselves and created the artificial boundaries that we now know uh, in Africa. And, and I consider them to be uh, brainless men really who didn't even consult the people uh, before they did what they did. So can we go to the next one? And so that's me reimagining uh, that, uh, that conference. And um, so, Okay, so can we go to then the next image? So when I created my map, I wanted to um, remove the, the whole notion of national boundaries. And I wanted to look at the cultural capital coming out of Africa. 
So, and the world actually learning from Africa, not, um, you know, Africa as enslaved people. And so, and I looked at some of the names and some of the um, names we've come to be familiar with. I mean, we know at the moment that um, one of the biggest areas of pop music right now is Afrobeat. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and that came out of Africa. Uh, you know, so there's uh, Fela Kuti, um, and also there are writers, you know, like Chino Achebe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and there are kind of just several, you know, really highly accomplished um, Africans and what they've given to the world. I mean, you know, there are other artists like Gada Ama also, and there's also a, uh, you know, an African engineer, uh, called uh, Kevin Doe as well. Um, so there are many, many. And so they're in the areas of music, science, literature, art, film, entertainment, philosophy. Um, and so, and then can we go to, to the next image? And so that's the globe and, and the globe, um, you know, just to, that, that's just a rendering to show you what the globe uh, looks like, uh, kind of illustration there. But, but what um, I don't want people to do as artists is to feel um, constrained or to feel that they can't express themselves. Um, you know, this is not prescriptive. So this is more about giving you a platform to expand your imagination and to take control of the narrative of enslavement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yinka. That is exactly our message today. And I, um, I, first I have to say, Scramble for Africa is one of my favorite pieces. I just, it, it's, it's so brilliant. It's so clever. It's, um, and, and it really focuses your mind on this idea that this group of people really pivoted the fate of so many others in, in one of possibly mo the most um, uh, historically critical conferences in, in the kind of human civilization, I would say. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I, I, I always love the, your use of, of texture and color and the, um, particularly the African fabrics. Um, it, it actually, it, I wanted to ask you about hybridity um, in your work because there's, um, you know, you were born in London, you grew up in Lagos, um, you went to university in the UK, you live between the two. So there's a lot of hybridity in your life um, already and, and you bring that into your work. Um, what does that hybridity mean to you? How do you um, navigate that? So, I mean, hybridity is a very uh, important thing for me and for my autobiography, as you, as you mentioned. But also, historically, um, we have to be extremely mindful of essentialism because we know that uh, fascism came out of essentialism. Uh, it's about excluding others. It's about excluding other cultures, it's about inward looking. Uh, so the consequences of not acknowledging the interrelationship we have, unfortunately, um, the end result could be fascism. And, mm -hmm. and so this is actually extremely serious. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, so I think that, you know, we ought to acknowledge how we work together and the overlap of our cultures and celebrate that. And that's what I do. Uh, you know, we need to celebrate that. We don't have to segregate. And we know that, and we also know that actually nationalist ideas are relatively modern concepts. Mm -hmm. They're fairly, it's a fairly new idea. And, um, you know, so those essentialisms we've created are all fairly artificial. And that's what's so great about this World Reimagined project, because we're giving people the opportunity to 
move beyond the constraints and actually free themselves from, from this kind of, um, you know, uh, conventional narratives that, that have actually, that kind of constrain them and constrain the imagination. Mm -hmm. So we want to expand the imagination. Mm -hmm. And as, as artists, we don't have to fit ourselves into those constraints. So I guess, you know, hybridity is kind of moving beyond those constraining notions of confinement. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for this, Inka. I, um, I could not agree more. And we had a, a fantastic discussion last week about, um, about not constraining artists and making sure that artists are able to use their imaginations as a tool um, uh, within their, their palette. So, um, so what uh, we have done um, in the artistic program is, is moved away from one of the criteria that we had mentioned before about historical accuracy. And um, rather than putting those boundaries on the artist, which as Yinka has so eloquently explained, are already artificial and, and already created by the victor in many cases, um, we are really looking um, when we receive the open call submissions at the artistic expression. We're looking at the thematic expression. So the journey of discovery is the conceptual framework that we're offering for you to explore. And um, if you go on the website, you'll see uh, the all nine themes. Also, our last masterclass, you'll see um, that we dive into these themes with two historians. So, um, so that's the framework, um, but we really want to, we really encourage you to explore. And the only thing that we really do ask you to consider as artists is that this is a public art project. Um, and so people of all ages, and um, all backgrounds are going to be experiencing this art. And our goal is to bring people into the conversation and meet them where they are and, and draw them in. And so it's important that we think about, as I talked about before, certain images um, that have been repeated over and over and the graphic nature of them and, um, and the impact that that can have on viewers. So, um, so we just ask that that's taken into consideration as you, as you send in your submissions. Um, I am going to bring on our next guest. Let me please introduce um, our next guest who uh, is also an artist. She's one of our principal artists and someone who has explored race, identity, power, spirituality, leadership, gender um, in her work, um, multimedia work. She has done um, a extraordinary amount of research on uh, the transatlantic slave trade and modern slavery and um, has done a series specifically about that that we'll talk about. And um, she's also looked into leadership, as I said, uh, and has a series on my idol, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, as well as other world leaders. Um, so I am thrilled to invite our next guest, Nicola Green, to, um, to the masterclass. Nicola. Hello. Thank you, Ashley. Hi. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you um, as part of the World Reimagine um, artistic group, the, the principal artists. And also um, because I think you, you offer a really critical uh, perspective. Um, as I said, you have uh, such deep knowledge of all of the things that the transatlantic slave trade brings up as far as identity and race and, and history and pol politics. Um, but what I uh, one of the things that I think is is so um, important about your involvement in this particular project is that you are not 
of African descent um, and that you're able to contribute a really important perspective. And so um, on our first masterclass, one of the questions from our viewers was, I am um, you know, white British and I want to engage in this, but I'm not sure if I should. And so I would love to hear your perspective on why you are part of the World Reimagine. Thanks, Ashley. Um, well, that's, a, that's an important question. And it's an especially important question for this particular project. And as it's gonna be a nationwide project that aims to really kind of educate and uh, raise awareness and, and, and really, you know, in terms of the art, make everybody think and reimagine. So um, uh, I'm gonna start by answering that question by taking us all back to the early 2000s. <laughs> um, okay. And actually back in at the turn of the century, the United Kingdom uh, was only just beginning to actually reckon with its shameful past in respect of the transatlantic slave mm -hmm. trade. And it hadn't, there, was, there had been no public uh, formal acknowledgement of that past uh, at all. And I think uh, it's important to kind of think about the last few centuries. If the 19th century was kind of really about freedom and getting freedom, the, the, you know, the abolition of the slave trade and the freedom of people and of countries, uh, the 20th century was really a century that was focusing around rights, human rights, the civil rights movement in America. It was only in 1979 that the Race Relations Act was passed in the UK. And you know, wow. the United Kingdom was still a colonial actor in, in the 20th century. India only got independence in 1948, Guyana only in the 1960s. And so we kind of came into this century um, really only just kind of achieving rights, if you like, and uh, in relation to race. And uh, we are, you know, have begun and I hope will kind of uh, continue for the rest of this century uh, and a century of repair and reparation. And this project is a really important sort of part of that. Uh, but back in the 2000s, the black, uh, Tony Blair was in government. Um, the uh, black politicians in government at the time, uh, my husband, David Lammy, uh, Paul Boateng, Valerie Amos, Patricia Scotland began a big campaign um, to uh, get the government to uh, commemorate the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade in 2007, which it had been in 1807. And that was a massive campaign. It required a huge amount of work. Um, and actually the Caribbean countries got involved. There was international kind of support. The Caribbean countries all kind of campaigned at the UN, big UN conference in Durban. And eventually the UK government sort of agreed, agreed to that. And as, and as you know, there was then a big kind of commemoration in 2007. And the work that I did uh, was a part of that. Uh, my husband was culture minister at the time and he also, uh, uh, became very, um, uh, uh, he, he was determined to make sure that there was a kind of constant reminder of that period and that it didn't just pass away. And so he got the funding for the International Slavery Museum, which, uh, and I was very involved in that. And the International Slavery Museum asked me to do a series of work that really focused on contemporary, telling the story of contemporary slavery, but through the lens of this moment in time when the United Kingdom was kind of um, focusing and acknowledging um, its history in relation to the slave trade. And so the work that I made at that time, it does contain images of bondage that was kind of really thought through with them. It was in collaboration with Anti-Slavery International, and it was really important to them in that moment that that, that relationship was kind of established. And actually, it's important to remember that a lot of people in the United Kingdom, you know, slavery was kind of it physically at least at arm's length. And a lot of people at the, mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom were not taught about slavery uh, such mm -hmm. as we are. It's really about the abolition and primarily white abolitionists. And mm -hmm. so there are very many, many people in the United Kingdom that don't really know about the story of slavery. They don't really know about 
transatlantic slave trade or what its consequences were and what those consequences still are. And so that commemoration in 2007 and that work at that time was really important in beginning that story. And the world reimagined is an incredibly important a uh, part of that ongoing kind of national conversation in the UK, because frankly, we've been in denial. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want, I, I think it's important in that context uh, that uh, artists, you know, Yinka has ha got an incredible vision for this project. And I think it's important that artists uh, you know, who are not of African descent also consider what their ideas, their reimagining, their kind of um, part of the conversation, because unless we have this conversation all together, we won't be able to move forward in this century. And so um, it's important for everybody to um, imagine and to um, kind of contribute if you like um, and that may raise all kinds of different conversations that are important for us uh, to have and so I would encourage anybody whatever stage they are on in understanding race in understanding the transatlantic slave trade um, as well as their artistic journey whatever age they are wherever they're from that everybody sh uh, should feel able to put in an application and it would be really wonderful to see a massive range of voices um, so I'm going to move on now to my presentation can I just like, say what you think that yes exactly thank you so much for inviting everyone because that is exactly what we want everybody in this conversation so that we can move forward. Um, I will just say uh, for Nicola's presentation, which is phenomenal, um, there are some images of, of bondage. And so we are sensitive to um, how that is uh, received and wanted to give a bit of advance notice for that. And uh, in the previous um, masterclass, we talked a bit about uh, mental health and the importance of um, thinking about your mental health as an artist, as you engage in this project. So, so please do keep those two in mind. And last thing is after Nicola's presentation, we will go into the Q&A. So please do put your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to get to as many as possible. Thank you, Nicola. So this is an exhibition uh, of the work. The photographs are at the bottom are by various different photographers working with Anti-Slavery International. Um, this exhibition was in Tottenham in Bruce Castle Museum in um, 2007. Um, if we move on to the next slide, this, this is a slide that has an image of bondage, just to warn everybody. Um, so this piece is, um, is actually vast in scale. And what I wanted to do was really to focus in this image on value. And so I've used 24 karat gold leaf and I've made it in the style of an altarpiece and of a triptych. Um, and I was really thinking about exaltation and divinity and using the rarest uh, gold to sort of attribute this value uh, that has been used so much in the Western canon uh, to, to and re kind of imagining that value and giving that value to uh, those people who've been treated as disposable. And uh, it's also why the faces are not in this image. It's, it's, it's to give uh, um, the highest value, if you like, um, to, to what has been uh, um, least valued over mm. the past uh, centuries. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, I did a lot of workshops at the Dulwich Picture Gallery. The, this work was exhibited at the Dulwich Picture Gallery and uh, with children. And uh, what was incredible, uh, you can see in some of these images, some of the artworks that the children themselves made. 
A lot of these children were actually refugees themselves. Uh, many of them had had siblings that had been enslaved and they made extraordinary, really absolutely incredible images. And they really, I wanted to show them because they really show the importance and power of the visual image in facing trauma. Um, and also had to encourage people of all ages <laughs> to engage in this project because everybody's voice and thoughts are important at whatever stage they're at. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, this is a piece of work I made with Obama. It is actually is his hand, but it's really not about him. It's about the value of that struggle. Um, it's it's yeah. really honoring um, his mixed heritage and I made it honoring my own three children and their heritage. And I was really thinking and considering how artists um, depict skin tones and how that has been depicted through the history of art and especially kind of in the history of the West, Western art. And I really wanted with this piece to honor the and give value, the highest value is the most expensive 24 karat gold that I could, could buy. And wow. to give that struggle, the struggle of freedom, the struggle of rights and the ongoing struggle of reparation, that highest value, if you like. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna talk about my globe. I have not got a final image of mine. So this is a series of ideas more. And um, my globe, I want to reimagine uh, and give value to the men and women and children that were enslaved and to think about, reimagine all of our future and to think about how our history informs our future. And specifically, so I'm, I'm tackling the ninth um, sort of uh, theme, if you like, in the world reimagine. And my globe is going to really focus on the relationship of racial justice and climate justice. Mm. So the, the sort of top part of my globe is going to consist of black and brown and mixed heritage angels. <laughs> and I've done a lot of work for anyone that's interested. There's, I have blogs on the history of sort of divinity and angels um, uh, in the Western canon have been depicted uh, almost exclusively as white and male. Um, and I have reimagined them and have rethought them. Uh, maybe move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, so I really want to kind of my, my globe to focus on the theme of life and death, if you like. And so these angels will represent that at the top of my globe. Um, moving on to the next slide. The bottom, um, oh yeah, here's another. And the next slide, please. Um, and on to the next slide. So the bottom part of my globe is gonna depict and draw attention to the Guyanese rainforest. My husband and his family are from Guyana and we spend a lot of time there. Guyana has the largest pristine rainforest less left on earth. And um, the Lost World was based on Guyana. It is El Dorado. <laughs> it is still the Lost World in the sense that um, it is relatively sort of untouched. And as humanity, you know, we have the opportunity actually to preserve it. There are bits of our planet left that are that still protect our environment, and this is one of them. And so I wanna draw attention to that and the, the, the life there um, is gonna be kind of, you know, the, the sort of most substantive part of my globe, if you like. Mm. Um, I'm actually gonna use actual part bits from the rainforest and kind of gonna contemplate that life and death, if you like. Um, and moving on to the next slide. In the middle of my globe, coming out of that rainforest are gonna be lots of petals. And my petals are made up, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of inspired by Yinka's amazing uh, theme. Um, 
I, I actually, over the last uh, 10 years, have done a lot of work on the bun this bunting clover leaf map. This is a map uh, that was made in 1581. Uh, it's also a map of Mundi, and it was sort of from the time where maps were really conceptual and did not really depict territory in the same way. And I am going to use these petals to kind of think about um, uh, reimagining a world, I, I guess, where territory, where we move away for, from colonial territory and to a world where nature and our responsibility to it, if you like, is at the center. Um, if you move on to the next slide, um, this is some work I've already done on this on this um, cloverleaf map, and I um, you can actually see there are globes in 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 this map already. Mm -hmm. um, I think that her maps, you know, as Yinka said, um, they're an incredible way to tell stories and to reflect the world around us, but also the time and the place that they're created. And so I see this. The world we imagine is an amazing opportunity for artists of all ages all over the country to kind of together if you like find our way um through this period of time and to record you know it's everybody's opportunity to record uh, this time and place and to reimagine it and uh to kind of help map our path through the physical and also the spiritual realm and all the difficulties that we're facing at the moment. Um, so I'm hoping that my globe will will inspire those thoughts, but I really want to sort of encourage everybody to uh, think about how they can map this story um, and kind of contribute to this conversation. Fantastic. Okay, thank you so much for that. I love that we got to see an artist's work in progress um, and an artist's work that in, in its complete state. So um, as you open call artists, think about how to approach your um, globes. You can see the way that both Nicola and Yinka have brought um, many different um, influences into their um, into the dialogue of their piece, um, from Aboriginal art to um, to the the historical maps. Um, I will mention that not all the globes, again, are your canvas. So you can go into the direction of maps, um, should that be your direction. But you can also simply use it as um, as the canvas, and so. One of our uh, principal artists is looking at hair and the coils of hair or the lack thereof. And, and the entire piece will explore that um, as a representation of these different cultures that are mixed through the transatlantic slave trade. So, um, so you can go as abstract or as um, literal as you wish. Um, so let's uh, bring Yinka back to the conversation and let's go into our q and I have the first question teed up and I encourage anybody with questions to go into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and, and type them in and we'll get to as many as possible. So um, I wonder if we are allowed to use more than one of the themes or should we stick to only one theme? Um, it, many of the themes overlap in the journey of discovery. So, um, so you don't have to stick to one theme, but, um, but as you submit, you can, um, you can label more than one theme um, as you write about anything that you want to describe your piece. You're welcome to, to say it also overlaps with another theme. Um, and in that spirit, you can also submit more than one theme. So you can do a different design for a different, um, for multiple themes. Um, I will go to the, the next question. Um, this is a, a question for Yinka. 
What advice would you give to an artist who is making up submission for the first time? And are there any sources you would recommend looking into on the subject of the transatlantic slave trade? Well, that's, a... well, I mean, I think that the important thing is to um, look at examples of other artists work uh, to inspire yourself. Uh, you might want to, um, you know, even go, just go to museums or, um, you know, read up on other things. I mean, I get a lot of ideas from, you know, what I read, what I see, uh, places I visit. But, you know, as an artist, you're really, the imagination is yours. You know, you've got a lot of freedom. So I can't, you know, it's not the kind of project where somebody's kind of telling you what to think. You know, it's, it's really about what, what you think and your imagination and, and what you want to bring to the subject. So, and I can't really know that, you know, I mean, you, you, you will know that. So this is not about trying to tell people what to think. It's the opposite, actually. This is kind of giving you the freedom to do, you know, to do what you like, you know, based on the things that you're inspired by. But the more you feed, see, the thing about imagination is that the more you feed your imagination, the better it gets and the more it expands. And by feeding, I mean seeing, reading, watching, talking to people, you know, all, all of those things feed your imagination. And then you can create something which is unique. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Inka. Uh, Nicola, this is a, is a question for you. Can you tell us a bit about your artistic process? Um, is it mainly research-based? Um, that's a good question. Um, I do do a lot of research. <laughs> I really do. Um, I mean, that's actually, that interests me, that excites me. I like thinking about things. I like kind of uh, moving to lots of different places and understanding. I, you know, I'm interested in history. I like understanding the history. I like understanding things uh, when I'm going to tackle them. But, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, I think when I was younger, I was more literal. I felt that I had to obey some rules that nobody had set me, but I assumed existed. And as Yinka says, they don't. <laughs> and actually, the more free I was creatively and with just, you know, um, taking things that, you know, I walked into, I, I, I moved into a place where I let anything inspire me and I would pick up anything. Those, those angels came from a bit of wrapping paper that I got in a florist uh, originally, and I tore it off and they became a whole series of artworks. And I started with a bit of cellophane wrapping paper from some flowers. Um, and actually, so I think that Yinka's absolutely right. The more that you feel kind of courageous enough, but also childish enough to try anything and do anything that you enjoy and that inspires you um uh that i tried that's what that i do that as well as very serious research mm, i love it i nicola i love your your angel series i really do it's just gorgeous um so i have another question um about uh, the technical um aspects uh, thank you for this amazing masterclass. I was wondering about choice of materials. Are we limited to paint painting on the globes or can we have 3D contours emerging from the globes using other materials? So um, from a public health perspective, the, we can't have that much texture on the globes only because um, there's a concern um, from city councils, for example, that um, someone could get hurt in, in having anything protruding from the globe. So we have to keep the textures relatively low. Um, so we will have some artists who are using embroidery, um, artists who want to use glitter, 
um, or other pretty low textures, those are fine. Um, I would avoid adding protrusions. The other thing is um, not just the public health aspect of it, but also should anybody uh, disrupt your image and, and your sculpture, um, then the integrity of your piece is compromised. And we don't want that. We want your art and your vision to be upheld through the entire period of mid-August to mid-October when it is on display in the public across the UK. So please do try to keep the texture to a minimum. Um, and then just one or two other technical uh, pieces. We won't be able to have incisions into the globe. So really that fiberglass globe that you'll receive is the shape that we expect you to, to stick to more or less. Um, and uh, again, that goes back to public health and, and safety. So um, we have a, another question. Can the globe be- Can I just part... say something here? No, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Not yeah. at all, come yeah. on in. <laughs> yeah, no, you forgot to mention about weather and the rain and the sun yes. and all of those things. Because they have to yeah. think about that when they're thinking about materials. Absolutely. Um, we, you, that is 100% true, um, Yinka. Please think about the materials that you will use. Um, we will uh, offer um, and use for every single globe um, a, a resin that covers the globe and seals it, essentially. So. Um, so it won't just be the paint or or the the medium that you choose to use on it initially. It will be sealed, and that sealant has a anti graffiti um, protection on it too. Um, so that's um, yeah, that's something to keep in mind when you, for someone who's never done a public art piece that will be in the elements. And, and even though it's mostly summer, we know how British summers are. <laughs> Not always sunny. Um, so thank you, Yinka. Um, let's see, can, another question, uh, can you explain a little more of how the idea will be transformed into a globe? Is the fiberglass a sort of, sort of holding for the piece of work? So um, the fiberglass, you, you will, as an artist, work directly onto the fiberglass. So even though your submission is in landscape and is a rectangular submission, um, it will be wrapped, you, you, will, you will cover, um, essentially, should you like, the entire globe itself with your design. So, um, so just in the same way that you might think of a map of the world, um, how it's how it looks um, on paper is different than it looks in 3D, but essentially it's the same image. Um, so so yeah, just think about the the going from 2D into 3D. Um, uh, Leslie Ann, thank you for your question. Um, will the globe be accessible to those outside of the UK? So yes, um, we will have um, our, our website, we will have an app, and we will be able to, um, people will be able to access that remotely. And um, so the actual globe itself is stationary. It will not move over the three month period but the image will be spread, we hope, around the world. So um, I, I'll have one last question. Um, is it only, is the open call only open to British artists? That is artists from England, Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. Okay, so um, a little bit in the language there. It is open to any British, based, UK based artist. So you don't have to be from England or from Wales, but just for logistical purposes of um, allowing you to um, come into the free studio space that we're going to be offering in the seven cities 
where the um, globes will be featured. That, that is why we have limited it to UK based artists, but you could, um, you could, uh, your nationality could be from anywhere in, in the world. Okay. Um, I have, uh, there's, there's so many questions we want to get to. Um, please, if you do have questions, please go to the website, um, check out the website. Hopefully we are answering your questions there. If not, um, then we, you can go to our um, email uh, and, and email us. And uh, we also have all of our social media outlets uh, that you can connect to. I, um, our email address is hello at theworldreimagined.org. And I'd also really love to extend the opportunity to become a part of the World Reimagined team. <laughs> we have uh, a handful of job opportunities for you to become part of the team and, and help bring this project into the world. So please do go to our website, theworldreimagined.org and check out um, the, those uh, potential job opportunities. So as we come to a close, I just want to thank our artists. Um, thank you, Yinka. Thank you, Nicola, so much for your support over the, these past years now that we have been working on the World Reimagine. Um, we are deeply grateful for all of your um, support and, and engagement in this project. I'd like to thank the World Reimagine team who are behind the scenes today, who are um, making sure everything works technically and, um, and trying to reach as many people as possible. Thank you, and thank you to our audience. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for listening. And um, we are so excited to see your um, to see your your submissions. Um, I'd also just like to remind you that um, both Nicola and Yinka have websites that you can go to and see more of their gorgeous work. Yinka has a phenomenal foundation. Um, that I'd love to have talked about, but we have run out of time, but I encourage you to, to go to his website. Yinka, do you want to tell us what the website is? Um, yes, yeah, so that's yinkashonibarafoundation.com. Thank you, perfect. All right, thank you all so much, and please tune in for our next World Reimagined Masterclass with uh, our co director, um, co-founder, Michelle Gale, and um, Rose Hudson-Wilkin. We are so excited. One of our um, patrons who will be joining us and um, talking more about identity. So please join us for our next one. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.